John Elliott and I had a lovely conversation last night, which will linger in my heart for quite some time. So I thank him for this last minute invitation to speak to you, which was extended, I think, around 9.15 last night. Um, but I'm delighted to talk about this because this theme of harmony and this conference, there are models, there are echoes of the past that I think can reach out and touch us. In the beginning was the song, and the song was God. There was a worldview that originated in many ways or was articulated by the man who tortured me in geometry class, Pythagoras. Do you remember all, all remember a squared plus b squared equals c squared? But in the ancient world, he was not primarily known originally for mathematics, but for a way of life, for articulating a pathway that was filled and echoed and shimmered with the divine harmony. And the question before the Pythagoreans and this idea of the music of the spheres is this idea that we are swimming in the celestial symphony and we don't have the ears to hear it. So the question for each of us is this question that is so alive and so pregnant for our time. How do we have the ears to hear? How can we have the eyes to see this divine symphony that surrounds us, that we are part of, and yet we don't know? So part of the idea of the harmony of the spheres, that's an idea that permeates across the centuries. We see it in the artwork here of Hildegard von Bingen, a 12th century Rhineland mystic. And this is her idea of the choirs of angels that are surrounding us all the time, all the time. It's an idea that stretches its hand out to pass that light to Dante Alighieri, when in the final vision of paradise, the culmination is all the souls coming together again in these choirs, each soul finding their own petal, their own petal where they sing forth and are part of the divine chorus, which in my imagination sounds like the Monteverdi choir. But Bach is this, not even Bach is the center, it is God in the center there. And so the Pythagorean idea of life was this idea that in order to be in harmony, we have to be in tune. And we all know this experience painfully well of hearing people sing out of tune or being out of tune with ourselves, both at a, a level of the actual sound, but also inwardly and psychologically. And so the Pythagorean way of life, which I think holds up such a beautiful image, is this question of how do we tune ourselves? How do we tune ourselves to hear the symphony, the song that we swim in? And it became the foundation of so much of what is good and what is true and what is beautiful in the Western world. From Plato to St. Benedict, the foundations of this way of seeing and being originate with the Pythagorean way of life. This is an image from the 19th century paying an homage to this, that the way that we can tune ourselves to hear this invisible, largely inaudible symphony consists of finding a way to bring ourself in attunement. It was a rhythm of life that begins in silence when at the morning's dawn, the Pythagoreans would gather to sing the sun up. And it was a rhythm of life then that rotated seasonally throughout the day as well as throughout the year. Song, silence, study. Song, silence, study. Within a community, a community that was sustainable in their actual practices, they were vegetarian. A community that was communal, they gave their possessions together to be held in common. A community that was radically egalitarian. Pythagoras gave extreme prominence to the women in his community and women and men as well were leaders. It, the course of study to tune the soul was to see this divine pattern, to hear this divine theme in all of its manifestations. It became the roots of what was called the quadrivium in the Latin world. So it was to see that there was this fundamental unity and that that could be expressed in arithmetic, in geometry, in astronomy, in the stars, and in music. And if one was tuned, if one listened, if one looked, one could begin to see this pattern permeate 
the universe. Now, Pythagoras himself then saw all of the ways that this logos, this divine pattern, was, was spread throughout the world. It's often thought that his wife, Theana, was the first person to discover the golden mean and the phi. And that pattern that some of you saw, I hope, in some landscape architecture, and, and that is realm. He himself found this pattern, in, according to the legend, where he was walking past a, a blacksmith shop one day, and the hammers were ringing, and he heard this sound, this sound that was not jarring, that was not noise, but that was music. And he began to inquire, what is the foundation of this? And he found that it was a relationship. And I think that's what's really important. I wish they had taught me in geometry. It's not that numbers are sterile and dead things. There is a relationship. And when things are in right relationship with one another, there is music all around us. This is an image from Raphael's School of Athens that hangs in the Vatican. And what you see is his wife, Theano. Oh, you can't see it very well here, unfortunately. OK, you'll have to Google it. Raphael, School of Athens. And his wife, Theano, is holding a chalkboard. And on that chalkboard is a pattern that is a divine pattern of relationship. And Pythagoras himself here is inscribing notes in the book with sages of the centuries looking over his shoulders. This pattern that's on the chalkboard is this. It's the tetractus, which simply looks you know, like a triangle. But it's not simply a triangle. It's an image and a map of divine relationship. The one begets the two. The two begets the three. The three turns into four. And the relationship between them is really quite an extraordinary relationship. Because when you, when you take this and you turn it into sound, you get the foundation of Western music, which are known as the perfect intervals. If you take the relationship of two to one, the ratio, you take a string, you divide it precisely in half, what you end up with is an octave in music. Could we have a demonstration? We can't do it on the keyboard because it needs to be done with the human voice to make it perfect. In loud and strong. Excellent. Now I will tell you that if we were in, okay. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you, thank you. So that's, yes. Beautiful. The next relationship is three to two. So if you have these proportions on a string, what you end up with musically is what we call a perfect fifth. <laughs> Western music. If you go to the next level of relationship, you have four to three. That's what we call a perfect fourth. And let's put it together, fifth, fourth octave. Everything is created out of that, and from all things are born. That is the seed form and the short view of music history for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years is that first there was monophony where everyone sang in unison. Then we had octaves. Then we moved to a drone with there was the fifth. Then we added the fourth. What was defined as dissonant in each age changed. At one point an interval that we think of as quite sweet, a major third, was seen to be horribly, horribly dissonant. It's not perfect because it's not, it doesn't have these divine ratios. Originally, for hundreds of years in music history, only that which had perfection embedded in it numerically was allowed within the Catholic Church because it was a mirror of God. 
Now that mirror of God is reflected in this wonderful Renaissance image by uh, Robert Flood, who was, I believe, a contemporary of Copernicus. Um, or, sorry, slightly different, sorry, but we'll get into that because it's not Renaissance. But here we have the hand reaching out from the sky, the hand of God. And what he's doing is he's tuning the monochord. And the idea was that this pattern, this pattern that governed divine proportion in music was also a corresponded in astronomy. And it was thought that all of the planets had their own note that they were singing. And that when they sang together in the cosmos, it created this celestial symphony. What you see on one side then of this lyre are the notes, A, B, C, D, so forth. On the other side, you have earth, air, fire, water, elements, symbols of the planets. And what you see with these arcs is the relationship, the big arc of the octave, the fifth, the fourth. Now this is the basis in so much of the world. Um, this knowledge of the Pythagorean ideals weaves its way into a text by Boethius, which then gets transmitted into the Christian world. And nowhere did it survive better than at Chartres Cathedral, which has been called a symphony in stone. All of those divine proportions, those musical ideas were transcribed in architecture. So the relationship of the Gothic arches, the labyrinth which is in the center of this, the windows, everything that you see is a reflection of these Pythagorean ideas. Now if you are lucky enough to have heard a choir like Monteverdi in one of these chapels, in one of these buildings that were built according to Pythagorean ideals, Cistercian architecture, for example, is built according to these principles, you will have had an experience when the choir is in tune that it feels like your head is vibrating and it's going to explode. Part of the reason for that is you are hearing the vibrations that your ear cannot hear, just like a dog can hear a whistle. You're range of expanse has it, of what you can perceive has in fact expanded. And the Pythagorean ideal of life, silence, study, song, reflection, sustainable life, all of that was to tune you so you, your capacity to hear would grow and grow and grow. Your capacity to see would grow and grow and grow. A Pythagorean would walk into a building like Chartres Cathedral and they could hear it because they could see it in stone. It would be just like a musician, like Mendelssohn being able to look at St. Matthew's Passion and bursting into tears because he could hear it in his head. That was the intention of this way of life. It was a... Can I just interrupt you a second? Just about Boethius, do you mind? Did no, you, did I know. Him? I think Boethius is a key player after Pythagoras and Plato. Boethius, no, I don't know. Boethius was... Um, he was uh, consul to the Emperor Theodoric in about 500, 510 AD. And among his writings um, was a fantastic book called The Principle of Principles of Music, a, a book that had enormous influence uh, all through the Middle Ages and beyond. And he said that music, I'm quoting him, music is related not only to speculation, but to morality as well. For nothing is more consistent with human nature than to be soothed by sweet melodies and disturbed by their opposites. Mm. Thus, we can begin to understand the apt doctrine of Plato, which holds that the whole of the universe is united by a musical concord. For when we compare that which is coherently and harmoniously joined together with our own being, with that which is coherently and um, sorry, let me read that again. For when we compare that which is coherently and harmonious joined together within our own being with that which is coherently and harmoniously joined together in sound, that is, that which gives us pleasure, so we come to recognize that we ourselves are united according to the same principles of similarity. Tonality is really what allows music to express movement. And, you know, that's one thing that's gone from our culture so much. Um, particularly in concert giving nowadays, that, you know, people are rigid, people listen in a very kind of static and almost semi-paralyzed state. In classical music. I'm talking about classical music, sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking particularly in the Western world, whereas I've had the experience of going to South Africa and to working in Soweto with kids there, in, in, in the townships there, where it's totally natural and spontaneous for them to play, mm -hmm. to sing, to dance, 
to it all simultaneously. And it's so refreshing. It's not this rigid compartmentalization that we get in the Western world. And it's something that existed in medieval Europe. There was dance in church. There was um, the, the, the medieval mystery plays, uh, which were highly kind of pagan in, in some ways, as well as tapping into religious well, I like to think of it as, I use the phrase, spiritual archaeology. And so we have the Christian, and this you see this in the architecture, like a place like Chartres Cathedral is built on an ancient Druid site. So you have layers. So the Christian worship, a lot of it comes from Pythagoras, the whole Benedictine concept of study silent song. The Pythagorean way of life even um, persisted in parts of Europe until the 4th century AD, 6th century BC, is when he lived. Fourth century AD, the Pythagorean Brotherhood was still there. And it was like passing the torch from one culture to another. Here's, here's a pathway of life, here. And so that we have the rule of Saint Benedict rests on many of these ideas because the, the Brotherhood was predominant in Italy. And yes, the, the dance part is so important. Um, there is a codex from France that is actually looks like the labyrinth, and it is called Pythagoras, and it looks like the labyrinth, and the labyrinth itself was danced on Easter here at Chartres Cathedral, where they would hold hands and sing as they wound their way to the center. And a beautiful metaphor, we are all on one path coming to the center. So we find these echoes, these shimmers throughout the centuries, whether it's Hildegard or Dante or Chartres Cathedral, all of them seeking to answer that question, how do we tune ourselves? How can we find a way within our own being to be part, to be absolutely part of that celestial symphony, that image that Dante gives us in the final vision of the Divine Comedy? Now what Prince Charles jokingly said, in which my most esteemed uh, I don't even know the word for this man. I admire him so much. But, but what Prince Charles was alluding to in his open remarks is we've been out of tune ever since. And um, so part of what happened in the, the transition as we were seeking to find a new kind of harmony, moving into a new kind of harmony, especially this is related to my instrument, the piano, is that everything got slightly compromised to be able to modulate a, a phrase of traverse terrain from different keys. Many of you who study music will be familiar with this. It's known as the circle of fifths. Because what happens if you take that perfect interval that we heard, it, it's imperfect here, but remind us of what that perfect interval sounds like. And then you move to the next fifth and you go. <laughs> and you kept <laughs> and you keep going okay so you go start very low and then go to here and then take his note And if you keep going, and, <laughs> and we would need castrati for this, or countertenors, but if we had them, what we find is a compromise that if you go around this circle, eventually what happens, theoretically, is you end up where you started. There's a tiny little imperfection because it turns out it's not a closed loop, it's not a circle. It's not a criticism of Bach in anything, but it's always... No, I don't need that. It's, it's always a compromise. Sorry, I've been asked because of the recording. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. But you should hold it further away from it. You're too close to the mic. Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> sorry. But, um, you can see why Bach would have wanted to have equal temperament, because it means that when he was shifting uh, from organ to organ, uh, uh, in which are often tuned at different in different keys, and when he was conducting a choir and when he was conducting an orchestra, that he needed to have adaptability because he was stretching the bounds of music far greater than it had ever been done before, um, and that he was modulating into really foreign keys like D flat and G flat and F sharp minor and so on. 
Now, he needed um, a fixed scheme, and hence the, the keyboard. But if you're brought up, as I was, to, to uh, on the Pythagorean system and with perfect intervals, um, the whole concept of a piano tuning is abhorrent. It, it grates. It, 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 there's always an imperfection built into it. It's a huge there compromise. There is no perfection inside of it. And I say that most humbly as someone who adores both Bach and, and the piano. But, but everything is not mathematically precise. And, and it's audible, audibly imprecise. So it won't do the same thing to the top of your head. If you're listening to things in Pythagorean tuning, whether it's Hildegard of Bingen or Monteverdi or any uh, pilgrim songs, that if you're listening to them in one of these Gothic cathedrals, Cistercian chapels, the top of your head will be completely vibrating because of what's known as the overtone series that extends far beyond what we can actually hear with our physical ear. It makes our bones shake and quiver and tremble. The big problem comes with thirds and sevenths. Let's just go for a few thirds. Sing a bass note. La. Major third. La. Now, sing a minor third guy against that. Will. La. Oh, that's tempered. He's, he's, he's brought it really right, right down, which I prefer, actually. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's the thing is, when, when you're in choirs and, and you've just got voices that you don't have to bother with anything. You can adjust it. Yeah, and so that's why mm -hmm. people go, well, that's why people love choirs so much. I yeah. think it's because when they have those fine, particularly final chords, you, I think you probably work a lot on of course final I do. chords. And just make them absolutely, and then, and then when it happens, it's just... Mm. It's so perfect. It's, it's so un un unbelievable because uh, if you imitate the keyboard with a choir, you will get these horrible... Um, uh, rubbing, uh, uh, dis d um, chafing discords or semi semi discords, whereas with a choir and voices you can get beautiful tempered major thirds and minor thirds and sevenths. And so often the sevenths, the leading note, is too sharp. It grates terribly. I mean, uh, when I was at Cambridge, um, the, my college was King's College, Cambridge, and um, uh, David Wilcox just loved very, very sharp major sevenths and very sh bright major thirds and very dull minor thirds. And it, it just set my teeth on edge. It, um, and it doesn't suit earlier music at all. It, I mean, if you're doing, I mean, you did at Trinity, you must have done Taverner and Talis and Bird and, 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 and Palestrine and so on. And it, it's a, a most appalling kind of distortion of that music if you do it. Tunings were different for different uh, times of, of, of musicals, music's evolution. You know that, that uh, and I, I have friends that actually sort of like um, like to tune up their A's to sort of four 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 or four five four four five, which is a different thing. It's the pitch rather than the, the way that the pitches relate to each other. But this this constantly shifting ground of the tuning and the pitch is is a sort of part of music's evolution, isn't it? Absolutely is, and, and it, it's a huge mistake for keyboard players to become conductors, I think, because they then impose their own horrible um, <laughs> sense of distorted pitch um, on an orchestra or on a choir. And it's, you probably don't agree with this, Pauline, do you? I would never dare to disagree with no, you about you musical notes. <laughs> well, I long to be a conductor myself someday, but that's, that's for a time. Well. But, but the, the w I want to get back to one thing, because I think this is really important for our theme and, and is universally applicable, I, though I love this conversation here, which is the moral effect of music that Boethius Indeed. points to. Yeah. And Plato and Aristotle, we, we had a worldview at one point that music was not entertainment. Nowadays, we can't escape music. We go into an elevator, we go into a grocery store. It's assaulting us at every turn. But music... Both of those philosophers said, shaped the moral character of the world. What kind of music you listen to. And we have gone a very far away from this absolutely precise perfection to we think about what music expresses. Does it express what is most noble and loftiest in our world? Or are we constantly inundated with images, with mantras, if you will, that assault the soul and the senses, both musically and in terms of their lyrics? This is so important. I, I absolutely endorse everything you're saying about that because um, I think we, we live in a world of noise pollution. Uh, and uh, it's so important, it's so healthy for the soul. It's vi not, not, not only healthy, it's essential. vital. It's essential for us that we actually reroute our hearing mm -hmm. and our being in terms of perfect intervals and perfect euphony, perfect tonality. Which is one reason why I love the 
contemporary composer Arvo Perret because he does, he does use that. this and he uses silence. And those two things to reclaim those, Arvo Perret, P-A-R-T, Estonian composer, who steeped himself, who felt that Western music was a dead end, and he steeped himself in silence for two years, self-imposed silence, where he went to an abbey. And when he came out of that, he wrote the most spare music, music that reflects Eliot, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything, of going back to these perfect intervals and back to silence. And so what does that do to us? What does that do to us? And this was the fundamental questions. Not music as entertainment or music as pleasure, but music as shaping the clay of the human soul, of softening it, of opening us up so that we can receive those larger messages, those larger messages that are part of the celestial symphony all around us. But we do not have the ears to hear or the eyes to see. This is Hildegard of Bingen. I just want to finish with this image. This is Hildegard of Bingen, again, that 12th century Benedictine nun who was a great ecologist, a spiritual writer. They still use her works on natural medicine in Germany and France, who talked about a holistic way of life. And this is her image of the earth, 12th century Benedictine nun, with the fecundity and the change of the seasons surrounded by earth, air, water, fire. And surrounding that, the first image that I showed you, that we imagine that we are that little white center there, but we are surrounded by this celestial music. And if only we can tune ourselves and our communities to this divine song, what would the world be like? That's really good. Thank you, Kenny. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's go move on a little bit. Let's let's just nail one thing that, uh, in case there's a misunderstanding, I absolutely endorse what Kaneen was saying about the morality, or it's following Boethius, the morality and the spiritual content of music and the perfection of music, that it's not just entertainment, but the barriers, that the membrane that we uh, introduce between something that is entertaining and something that is serious is a very artificial one. Why can't they be both? Why is it not possible to, as, as I'm sure existed in the medieval church, to be hugely invigorated, entertained, uplifted in a secular way in, through your bodily physique, your, your, the, the motions of your body through dance, and at the same time have a spiritual awareness of the underlying principles? The two should go together. Now, things started to go wrong in during the Reformation, didn't they? Also in terms of the moral imperative. In, in terms of the moral imperative as well of music, I think there's also a barrier between the the entertainers and the entertained yeah. and the professionals and the, the non-professionals and that actually a, a moral imperative of music, uh, musical evolution has to be that we all actually do music. We make the sounds with our bodies because it's not just about receiving these sounds, it's about creating them ourselves. And that's a very important moral point. And, and Jill Purse has, is, has done so much to make me aware of, of this important difference between the participation and the receiving. Utterly agreed. And if in my lecture or little talk yesterday, I spoke mostly about professional music, it wasn't in any way to denigrate or to um, downplay the in extraordinary importance of amateur music making and the, the, the access that all of us should be able to have towards music making, uh, which is why we did that silly little round yesterday, so to show that it really is be not beyond the capacity of anybody who, even if they have very modest musical um, uh, horizons, to actually enter into this miraculous, magical world of music, so that um, music making is a, a universal uh, occupation and uh, an obligation, in a, in a sense. Um, now, historically, what went wrong? Well, things went wrong, um, not as the prince said in the 17th century, but actually earlier in the Reformation, in the sense that um, music at that stage, at the late medieval period, I'm thinking of the time of Josquin and the Palestrina, was still very much a reflection of the, the, the music of the spheres, of the celestial being, and a reflection of the Godhead. But 
Such was the corruption of the church at the time that starting with Martin Luther and others, the concept of reappropriating music to be an individual expression, um, so based on folk song, uh, folk melodies, became incredibly important. And what Luther did was to appropriate um, many of the uh, folk songs, and some of them quite raunchy and, and um, libidinous um, of his time, and to add his own vernacular German text to them and to sanctify them. So that places immediately the individual, the individual conscience, the individual being and awareness into the forefront. And what happens in the course of the 16th century, but above all around the year 1600, is that um, suddenly it's no longer a God-centric world, but it becomes a man-centric world. And that, of course, coincides with the Copernican Revolution and what Galileo and Kepler took from that. In other words, heliocentricity that uh, we're not all as the center of the world completely under the Godhead, but we are part of planetary motion, but we're circling the sun. And that music is, can still be a reflection of the heavenly spheres, but it's also a magnificent vehicle for self-expression, for expression of faith, for expression of love, for expression of the whole gamut of human emotions. And that's the revolution that takes place around 1600, which I find utterly fascinating. That you have in that generation all artists, historians, um, I beg your pardon, philosophers, physicists, painters, writers, all born in the 1560s or 70s. Perhaps in touch with each other, some of them were, some of them working completely in isolation, who are all bringing us catapulting us into the modern world. Shakespeare, Kepler, Pythag um, sorry, Shakespeare, <laughs> Kepler, um, Galileo, Caravaggio, Monteverdi. What's fantastic about uh, Shakespeare, Caravaggio and Monteverdi is that they bring everyday life into their works of art. Think of Caravaggio's religious paintings and how suddenly you find beggars from the street, prostitutes, uh, coming into his amazing chiaroscuro canvases, um, and they are everyday people with scars on their bodies, um, dirt on their feet, and yet they represent something spiritual. So it's 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 a squaring of the circle. It's bringing everyday life into a spiritual dimension. Shakespeare does it all the time in his plays. Think of how you know the grave diggers in Hamlet, or think of. Um, any of the any of the historic plays or any of the comedies, there's ne nearly always high life and low life combined, alternating. And the man who does it, in my book, best of all, is Claudio Monteverdi. Because Claudio Monteverdi, born in 1567, and it's now his 450th anniversary this year, and we're celebrating it with performances of his three surviving operas. Um, he grew up very much in the traditional um, Renaissance style of polyphony, um, in Cremona, Cremona the center of violin making of the Amati family and Stradivarius and so on. And then in the years that he spent at the Gonzaga court in Mantua, he caught the wave of novelty, the novelty which was started by the Camerata, this group of composers working in um, Florence who were uh, imagining slightly wrong-headedly, but nevertheless, we'll give them credit. They thought they were reviving the ancient music, the music of ancient Greece. In fact, they were invent inventing something brand new, which was the detachment of the human voice, the melody, from an independent bass line. Now, this is crucially important because whereas up until that moment, Western music is work working like a beautiful weave of parallel and uh, complementary lines with no um, no hierarchy. The melody um, is shared between four voices, five voices in the polyphony, and it's a fantastically selfless um, weaving together of beautiful lines. With Monteverdi, suddenly it becomes an isolated statement of a beautiful melody, 
underpinned by an independent baseline known as a basso continuo, which provides, just as these two have been doing, a baseline with an interval above it, but in Monteverdi's case, a much more elaborated sense of fluent tension and relaxation, that you have consonant intervals then with strategically placed dissonant intervals like diminished fifths, uh, sevenths, diminished sevenths, and so on, augmented intervals as well, that relax back into consonants. And it gives a friction, a constant play of, of tension, relaxation, and friction, which gives an immense pathos and angularity in the expression of human emotion. And suddenly, the whole gamut of human emotions, which has been completely um, marginalized in the music of the Renaissance and, and, and uh, prior to that, becomes very uh, in the forefront. It becomes uh, hieratic, it becomes immediate and, and extraordinarily eloquent. So that in his madrigals, and he wrote nine books of madrigals, and above all in his operas, and uh, he wrote about 16 or 17 operas, and we've lost the bulk of them. What we've left with is the three. The first one that he wrote, Orfeo, the second that he wrote, The Return of Ulysses, Il Ritorno di Ulysse and Patria, and the third one, Coronazione di Popea. In those operas, he is able to express in a way that no one has done before this sense that we, human beings, for good or ill, are at the center of our world, and our, our emotions can be captured and enhanced through musical expression beyond words. I mean, he was always somebody saying, um, prima la parola, first comes the word, yes. But that was not totally honest. He meant, first of all, I listen to the word, I articulate the word, but I underpin it with my music, and my music can bring it to a different level, take, take it up to a completely different um, notch in, in the stratosphere of expression. So that with Monteverdi you have grief, you have sorrow, you have anger, you have martial bellicose um, emotions, you have incredible tenderness, you have a spirituality, um, and you have, uh, at the other extreme, erotic, very sexually explicit music. I mean, uh, Popea, I don't know if how many of you know the coronation of Popea. The coronation of Popea is highly topical. It's, it's, um, it's about a very corrupt society. It's Rome, it's Ven the Venetian um, Republicans cocking a snook at ancient Rome and the corruption of Nero and his... Um, uh, new inamorata, uh, Popea, who is a minx. She's a, she's a strumpet, and she's uh, got her eye on the main um, chance, which is to become empress. And you think, how can this man, who is a, at this stage a priest, he's become a priest, and he's like, how can he possibly be writing music of such total amorality? Well, the extraordinary thing is, such is the alchemical power of music, that you, despite your misgivings and your criticism of what Monteverdi is doing, you're beguiled, you're completely um, disarmed by the incredible beauty of the music. So that the opera ends with the most incredible duet called Portimiro Portigoda, which some people say is not even by Monteverdi. I don't believe that for a second, it's certainly Monteverdi. Um, it, it, despite the fact that you know that Nero is a total a scumbag, I mean, he's a Donald Trump par excellence. And that Popea is, 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 as I say, a strumpet, uh, ambitious and s sexually uh, un un uncontainable, that you feel such an empathy as a result purely of Monteverdi's incredibly expressive music. You, you feel a sympathy and um, you really want well for them. You, you, you hope for the best. If you know you, th the next opera, which doesn't exist, she's going to uh, uh, have her head chopped off and he's going to be for the chop as well. But at that moment, such as the incredible um, emotional content and, and expressivity of Monteverdi's music, you're completely beguiled. Now that's the revolution that's going on, and you can say the same, of course, as Shakespeare plays, which you're familiar with. And it, it, it's this generation which completely transforms the way we look at the world. It, it, it means that our capacity for change, for good, for evil, is it there to be expressed. Um, and to be uh, made available in an art form. 
whether it be Cervantes' novel Don Quixote, or whether it be Shakespeare's plays, or whether it be the, the religious paintings of Rubens and Caravaggio, all of whom were together. There was a moment when they may have, all, some of them may have met at the court of Mantua, because in 1604, Monteverdi was still at Mantua, Rubens was court painter in Mantua, and um, Galileo was sniffing around looking for a job um, in, at the Gonzaga court, and he didn't get it, but he was going to be um, military engineer for the Gonzaga family. His history would have been a bit different if he'd got that job. So they couldn't, and one wonders what they talked about, those three, when they met. And, you know, who was William Shakespeare? No, nobody's ever really nailed who William Shakespeare was. Could he have been somebody not Will Shakespeare, who actually did travel to uh, Italy and who therefore had first-hand knowledge uh, uh, of Italy, which informs Romeo and Juliet, um, Antony and Cleopatra, uh, Julius Caesar, The Merchant of Venice, Two Gentlemen of Verona, all those plays which have an incredibly um, strong sense of, of Italy, the landscape. I'm not going to speculate on that, but except that to me it's one of the, the real fascinating coincidences that what Shakespeare is doing writing plays in England, Monteverdi is doing writing music and opera in Italy at the same time. I think we might pause there because there may be some questions before we go on to our next subject, which is the seasons and pilgrimages from there. I can't answer that question. I mean, I, 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 that's much too technical for me. I haven't a clue. I mean, I, I, would you like to answer that? I think that there's a, a profound difference. When you hear, when you're in the presence of live music, there, I think there's two things that happen. One of them is just no matter how good the sound system is, there's a different effect of the sound vibration. And I would leave it to an acoustic in engineer to talk about that. But there's also the very human dimension that to actually hear and encounter the person who is offering their music from their heart sure. yeah. is such a transformative part of that. So that very often, even um, in a great performance that's been recorded, when you listen to it afterwards, you know, there's there's something that's not there. I mean, you can have the echo of what was there. I just had this experience heard, having heard some extraordinary choirs at Oxford this past week in a festival. And the actual presence of seeing it come through, it's what they were, part of what they were talking about, the field of the heart um, in one of the sessions yesterday, that that you, you're not in that presence, you know, not in that moment. And there's something so truly magical. I don't think that's that. quite what you, that was not your question, really. So, um, on a technical level, a digital wave when it's played through a speaker, when you have, you know, you choose if you have an MP3 at different compression rates, and you can choose even at the very, very, very highest quality digital representation of a sound, what that actually means is lots and lots and lots and lots of little dots that when they join up, they look like a sound wave, but there are gaps in between all of them. So it is a fundamentally different sound. I mean, it's, it's, it, it sounds pretty good. It's like, as far as you, but absolutely at the heart, there's a gap. And the, the bits, your, your ear does the work to make up the rest, but it's not actually the same sound. So whether or not it has an effect on you is, is another question, but like fundamentally, they're technically different sounds, yeah. Well, I don't agree about Stravinsky, but I... I know what exactly what you're coming from, and, and atonality. And um, look, um, we, this is too big a subject to, to get into in detail, but it, in a very summary way, um, the revolution that I've been referring to with Monteverdi, um, the development of um, a diatonic system of harmony with a, a, a bass line providing the root of chords and different melodies clashing against that root, and sometimes in sympathy with it, sometimes in conflict with it, is the basis of music for the next 400 years, 450 years. And the past master of that, the two, well, the three past masters of, of that are Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. But by the time you get to Beethoven's death in 1828 and so on, and, and you get uh, the new generation of post-Beethoven composers like Schumann, Mendelssohn, Berlioz, the orchestra at that stage is the vehicle for human expression. It's no longer the madrigal. It's no longer even opera that comes 
resurfaces in the work of Wagner and Verdi, but uh, it's primarily the orchestra as an organism capable of expressing abstract thought and emotion in ways that had never been done before. Then, and this is a quick, quick trot, a very superficial trot through 19th century music, when you get to Richard Wagner, he throws the kitchen sink at it because he, he um, adds uh, voices, he adds um, rotten poetry, his own, um, uh, he inflates music to the extent that the rules that w had governed music for the past 400 years are stretched to breaking point because uh, a dissonance is no longer a dissonance anymore. It's, it, it's a new type of consonance. It, it, it's, it's so, uh, the chromaticism has become so extreme that it, there's, in a way, there's no center anymore. There's no bass line anymore. Um, you know the expression of Edith Sitwell, which I love, that in order to be eccentric, which she was, first of all, you have to inscribe the circle to be eccentric. So you have to establish a, a, um, a form, a baseline, or a circle, in her, in her case, to be eccentric. Well, Wagner was totally ex eccentric, to the point when, uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, a composer like Schoenberg, who was brought up very much in a, in a Wagnerian uh, tradition, felt that harmony, diatonic harmony, had lost its value, lost its, lost its groundings, and hence he invented this atonal system of 12-tone of, of music. Whether you like it, whether you uh, like it or, or, or you don't like it, um, you can see why it came into existence. It, it had to, th something had to break. And it's been a huge challenge for composers ever since. Do we, get, do we, which do we follow? Do we try and revive, which many composers do today, revive a, a sort of system of diatonic harmony? Do we go with atonality or do we go to something completely extreme, which is into ele electronic music? I have a feeling you want to say something, Guy. Yeah. Um, just, just in defence of Wagner, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, um, he, what he was doing was trying to remove the sort of really, really solid sense of a tonal centre, where you could always know what the tonic was. Um, he was, he wasn't removing it completely. He was just making it much more shifting, and so it, it fitted his dramatic goals. <laughs> it was shifting, and it was oh, shifting. shifting. <laughs> Um, but um, but this allowed him to create a much more through composed and very very flexible f musical form, which which really fitted his complete idea of the dramatic total work, which other composers hadn't ever really grasped comp totally. They had they had they had they had they you know the Mozart thing of having numbers arias then recitative. It was very kind of everything was very chopped up and clear. But his was a sort of flowing, sort of allowed you to get into this very strict. <laughs> Sorry, that's. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry, with, with great respect, that's boulder dash. But, uh, <laughs> Monteverdi had done, done that 500 years before, 400 years before. If you listen to the Coronation of Popea, if you listen to uh, uh, the Return of Ulysses, it's totally fluid. There's no rigidity of between recitative and aria. It flows. What Wagner claimed to have um, invented, Monteverdi had already got there. <laughs> If we look at the currents, though, of the entire 20th century, we see the same thing with the breakdown of form in art, you know, where there's no longer the representation or the clarity of line and the sense of focus. It's, 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 there's so many parallels where you look at, at what happens politically, too, with the advent of communism, and that didn't work any better than atonal music. Plato actually said that, that the introduction of new modes is always dangerous because as soon as you introduce a new mode, then um, the society will change with it. Can I give you a quick demonstration of modes even though it's going to be on a keyboard, so you'll wince. Um, in our modern world today, we use typically only a major scale or a minor scale. Um, there were different modes for every single city state, and so f you had a far greater range of what was possible. And this is, you know, would be much better if we had a liar. Unfortunately, we don't. So that the ones that he thought were beneficial were Dorian, which would bring up a very different feeling. So I'm just going to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for you in Dorian and see how it feels. <laughs> that would have an edifying effect. 
I think the greatest example is the, the tritone, which was not only this is a musical interval that was thought to open up the gates of hell. You could be excommunicated let's, let's hear, in the Catholic hear. Church. Sing a seat. With that vibrato. La. That interval we still hear when we go to France. It's the alarm. Right, and that was that was seen to be so morally dangerous that you would be excommunicated as a composer for using it. Prokofiev it's writes di a piece called Diabolicus. It was called Diabolicus. Yes, Prokofiev writes a piece in Russia called the Devil's Devilish Inspiration, that uses that over and over and over again. Well, that's kind of the cornerstone of modern music nowadays. So, um, but that question of what bec what becomes, you know, what is seen there, and one could look at it as an evolutionary perspective that what is consonant in one era becomes dissonant in another, and vice versa, and vice versa. Yeah, good. Okay. Let's use the Christian story. I mean, why not? We start in a Garden of Eden where everything's totally harmonious and beautiful, and and uh, it's incredible that you can't imagine how green the green is, and and where, the, where everything's in perfect tune. But then we have to explore. We can't just stay there forever. And we want to go, we want to sort of test out and, and go and see what happens if you do that and do that. It's, it's the human imperative to just constantly explore, to see if, wh if, if I do that interval, what's gonna happen? And, and we just, it, it, it'll, it may come round in a cycle, but I think it's that. I think it's, I th I think it's that curiosity that we just don't wanna stay in a totally harmonious, state we want to see where what where we'll go from there i mean that is totally natural but so dangerous isn't it <laughs> it it's what happens no but if in terms of uh, the theme of this conference yeah. and what you were saying uh, earlier about the need to listen and the 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 uh, the, the need to reroute ourselves we have to without quelling our curiosity or our nosiness and inquisitiveness um, and our willingness to, um, eagerness to experiment. We need to reroute ourselves each time, both in terms of the music that we listen to, the music we sing, the music we perform, and in the agriculture and the food production that we, that we are responsible for. That's, that's a hugely important question. And, it, and there's, of course, no clear answer because we, <laughs> we don't have records. But I mean, in all primitive societies, and social anthropologists have, have investigated this, singing precedes speech. And it does so in infants as well. And uh, the, the urge to, to uh, that is, uh, thank you, you've given us a wonderful segue because we're coming onto the seasons now. Um, in, in primitive societies, um, the rituals of life and death, the rituals of growing uh, crops, the rituals of um, celebrating the turning of the year are nearly always reflected in music of some sort. It can be very primitive depending on uh, and very um, uh, monos monosyllabic in a way um, compared to the richness of harmony that later developed. But it's hugely powerful and hugely um, entrancing and, and, and compelling and v vital that we cherish the examples that are, that are still there. Um, if I could just introduce one little reminiscence here that, that, uh, that was an eye-opener for me. Um, a few years ago, um, a viola player in my orchestra um, went to Soweto in South Africa and started an orchestra there in the township. And uh, she founded um, a, a charity called Buscade, which meant that um, I and my musician, several of us, went busking on Waterloo and Paddington and King's Cross and, and so on, Euston stations, and we collected quite a lot of money just busking. And with that money, we bought instruments, stringed instruments, which Rosemary then took to Soweto and handed them out, first come, first serve, to kids um, aged seven up to 14, 15. She did amazing work there. And after three or four years, she called me up and said, John, I could you come out? Could you bring some musicians? I think we've got something to work with here. So I went with 12 of my musicians to Soweto and we stayed in, um, we stayed in Johannesburg. 
and we were bussed into Kuwait every day, and our hosts thought we were completely zany, and we were stopped by police on the way and saying, do you know where you're going? Yes, we're going to Soweto. And when we arrived there in, in the church, uh, there were these amazing kids who had just grown to love music enormously, grown to love Western music, I should say, um, but they weren't quite getting it. Uh, I mean, we tried Purcell, we tried Bach, we tried Handel, just wasn't getting it. And then I suddenly thought, I know, Rameau. Who's Rameau? Rameau is the great French Baroque composer, contemporary of, of Bach and Handel, who wrote operas from the age of 50 onwards. And in his operas, he wrote fantastic dance music, a lot of it very uh, rhythmicized and, and um, folky. Uh, rigodons, tambourins, uh, contradances, like, like that. So uh, I got my office to fax through uh, all the parts of the various operas that had dances and, and stuck it on the music stands and, and see, uh, I saw what the kids were going to make of it. And they just adored it. It just corresponded to something um, incredibly uh, primal in, in their backgrounds. And not being self-conscious, they were dancing as they were playing their violins, or they were, they were actually moving around and dancing at the same time. And it was sort of hypnotic experience to see how these kids could, could just break down the barriers that we artificially put up in, in our music making. And I managed to get them to be invited to the proms, and we did a concert with their orchestra and my orchestra, um, separate and then together on the stage, dancing and singing together, and it was just amazing. That's hugely important, and it's it's borne out by lots of different experiments that are going on. I mean, uh, there's a, um, a, a wine producer that I know very very well in uh, Tuscany, who um, is he's a bio biodynamic um, uh, farmer, and he does companion planting to uh, uh, avoid pests um, uh, attacking his vines. But once the wine is in vat, he plays them recordings, <laughs> digital recordings, I'm afraid, of Bach cantatas. And he swears by it. He says the wine is improved by it. Now, that may sound completely f fanciful, and it could be fanciful, but it could have an element of truth in it. And I can witness uh, this in a different uh, way, by seeing what happens in my own lambing sheds and, uh, and barns when we're carving. And my sh a shepherd, uh, several years ago, always had Radio 2 playing very loudly during uh, lambing. And um, I used to come back from doing concerts at the Festival Hall or wherever it was in London, and I was sometimes um, on lambing duty at night, and I heard this cacophony going on, and, uh, and there was definitely a heck of a lot of r noise going on and distress, I thought, in the barn. And I just changed channels and got some Mozart and some Bach. And I promise you, calm, serenity then prevailed. And I'm sure people can come up with other, other examples. There is undoubtedly an impact on, of certain types of music on the way that plants and animals perform. There's some fascinating research that's being done on music in the brain, by the way, and I'll just point you, if you don't know it already, to the work of Oliver Sacks, and he wrote a book called Musicophilia, and a wonderful, beautiful documentary you have to watch with a handkerchief called Alive Inside and the Effects of Music on Patients Who Have Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Other Diseases, and the profound effects, which again go back to the ancient Greeks and their knowledge that music could be used to, um, to heal the idea of Pythagoras as healer and music as its role for transformation at a physical, chemical level. Well, certainly like the, the question of Alzheimer's is, is absolutely crucial to that because I've witnessed it with two family members, my mother and my sister, both of whom were musicians. And uh, when they'd lost the capacity for speech, they still had the capacity to listen and even to sing. I was singing folk songs with my sister, nursery rhymes with us, my sister, up until four days before she died. And that tells you something about what the question you raised as to what point does music come into society and what point does it leave us? I think it's crucially important. There's a lot of questions. May I just put you on hold a second because I really want to get onto this issue of um, the seasons and the rotation of the seasons and the concept of pilgrimage, because these two boys have got something to say about that. Um, 
Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Desperately beautiful piece, but desperately overperformed. It comes out of every single orifice that you hear in Venice. It's, it's, it's just kill, kills me, I can't bear, because it's, it's so jaded. Haydn's Seasons, on the other hand, which is one of his great oratorios, possibly his greatest, I think it's even better than the creation, celebrates, well, it's a matter of choice, but I think it's more consistent. I, I absolutely adore the, 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 the Yaris Titan of, of Haydn. It celebrates um, a, a community in Austro-Hungary that he was growing up in, that he was used to, where he performed at the Esterhazy court. And it does so in an incredibly vivid and evocative way, but that also is very, um, it's a wonderful synthesis of the pagan and the Christian. Um, it's, it, it, it welds the two together because it brings the rituals and the, the, the habits and the activities of the different seasons, whether it be um, uh, the, the wine harvest or whether it be um, the, the sowing of crops together in a spiritual environment. And it seems to me that that is an, a, another way that we can reconnect and we should and we need to reconnect our farming to our music, that um, the rhythms of nature and the rhythms of the unfolding of the seasons, the sequence of the seasons, is something so invigorating and so uh, uh, vitalizing. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's something that's been replicated in my life but with the pilgrimage that I did in, in 2000 when we performed all these cantatas of Bach, 198 of them, in different churches throughout Europe and then in, in, in concentric circles, starting in Thuringia where he was born and then going through Saxony and then wider and wider. So you're very, very tired, aren't you? Good. Um, and uh, going through to Scandinavia and then into Spain and into uh, Italy and eventually to New York where of all people, Rudy Giuliani, who was then mayor, came and sat with a baseball cap on and listened to Bach and Tartus because he said he grew up with Catholic music and he didn't like it very much and he preferred J.S. Bach. Very interesting. Um, what it did to me was to, to make me realize that somebody of Bach's huge musical sophistication was also somebody rooted in his society and rooted in the agriculture of his time because so many of his cantatas, which last 15 to 20 minutes, have a reflection or show a reflection of the cycle of nature, the cycle of uh, the seasons. And um, by performing the cantatas, three or four of the cantatas, on the specific Sunday for which they were composed, and then linking them up in the whole church year, gave one an incredible sense of the, the not just simply of the cyclical nature of his music making, but of its rootedness, how it actually fits into society and fits into the world he lived in. And the concept of pilgrimage is, is something that is really had a renaissance in the last 20, 30 years. And I'd love to hear from these two what they think about pilgrimage as an activity, as a health-giving activity. Can I pass on to them? Thank you, Will. Well, maybe we can just start by telling the story of how we got into pilgrimage in the first place and uh, it was a pilgrimage to the source of a song and the song was all about when farming goes wrong um, so in 1852 the itinerant hop pickers of Kent near Medway were Irish and Romany gypsy hop pickers basically slave labor they you know they were getting paid the minimum wage they were living in appalling conditions they had to work very hard and hops were a very profitable business if you were at the top of the pile. And the River Medway in 1852 was flooded, uh, much as it was recently. And at the end of the season, as they were crossing over these families on these carts, three carts at once, the bridge, which local farmers knew wasn't safe, and the Medway Navigation Trust, who was in charge of looking after the infrastructure, who were very rich, you know, the money from the rivers was, these were the trade routes in Old Kent and Old Sussex, the roads weren't worth toffee. So they were responsible for these bridges. But going over, the horses took fright, they kicked the bridge, all three carts went in at once. Three generations were lost in one go. Uh, one little girl lost her grandparents, her parents, and her brother and sister, just like that. And there was no justice to be had for these people because they were the bottom of the pile. They didn't really count in the economic system of the day. And, but what they could do is they could make a song. 
And that song has lingered. And our first introduction to pilgrimage was a journey on foot to the source of this song. About six days from my home. It's the first time we'd ever walked together. Um, and we didn't really know what pilgrimage was, but I'd been doing lots of long journeys on foot with no destination. And Guy had been in front of a computer screen, basically, for, what, nine years? Yeah, yeah. Writing about singing, but not actually singing. <laughs> <laughs> so together we made this journey to the source of the song. Um, and the synchronicities and the coincidences, the yield of them, was so strong, thick and fast, that we knew, hang on, this is something. This is, this is, this is powerful. And that was our introduction to pilgrimage. And when we, when we got to our destination, which was the, the monument, uh, ambitiously described as resembling an oast house, which is where they dried the hops, little concrete thing raised by public subscription. And next to it, 100 yards away, is Kent's tallest folly, built on the proceeds of hop picking, <laughs> apparently because the owner wanted uh, a tower to see into his ex-wife's bedroom window, so the locals say. Um, so we got there, and there were two other people there. And we said, you know, what are you doing here? Are you, uh, do you regularly come here? What's, what's your story? They said, no, we've never been here before. We tried 10 years ago. We couldn't find it. Uh, but we are here to say hello to our ancestors who, who died. And we said, oh, gosh, well, you'll know about the song then. They said, what song? <laughs> so we, not, we took the song not only back to the bridge and the place, back to the bloodline itself. <laughs> and it goes like this. Now seven thirty strangers are hopping they had been. They were employed by Mr. Cox's, that's near old Golden Green. Twas in the parish of Hadlow, that's near old Tunbridge Town. You should have heard the screams of all those poor souls as they were going down. Now some were men and women, and others girls and boys. They kept in contract with the bridge, but the horses they took fright. They kept in contract with the bridge, but the horses they took shy. You still can hear the screams of all those poor souls as they are going down. Now some were men and women, and others girls and boys. They were employed by Mr. Cox's, that's near old Golden Green. Twas in the parish of Hadlow, that's near old Tunbridge Town. That's where they laid all those poor souls. After they were drowned. To me, the way you sing that, the two of you, is so touching. And the fact I love the fact that you also, with very modest gestures, you gesticulate. You're not just stuffed dummies when you sing. You you actually move. Well, you do, and it's great. I don't want to make you self-conscious because it's excellent. It's it's brilliant. It's not the sort of um, you know stuffed dummy approach, but it just shows how music is on a different, and, and poetry of course, but is on a different level to prose. That music can enhance an emotion. It's what I was saying about Monteverdi and Bach and so on, but how even at, a, at the level of folk song, you connect in a different way to the landscape, to the society, to our own times. It's, it's, it's a medium that we need to, ch to cherish, not in a performance style, but in terms of our own collective response to the problems of the world. I mean, that was also an example of, by being in the land, when we, when we talked to these, this, this couple, and she said, oh, by the way, do you know that on the 20th of October, every year, you can go down to the bridge, and you can, apparently, you can still hear the screams. And so, we had, the first, the first line says, and, and you should have heard the screams as they were, as they were going down. So we thought, well, let's change the second verse, you know, you still can hear the screens as they are going down. Just, just subtle, but you know, by by going in the land, by actually singing it in the land, you can, the, the song can has its own life. It doesn't stop. It never, never gets fixed. And when when we set off, we believed we were taking that to the bridge itself, and we did. We got to the bridge, and everything went wrong. You know, it was the people who died there 
didn't want to hear the song about how they died. There's so much encoded injustice. You know, they were employed. They kept in contract. It's a subtle sort of rebellion, as much as the Roman gypsies of the day were able to say. But it wasn't, it wasn't for them. It was for th We were meant to sing this song to the living people on the way and tell their story. That's why the song was kept alive, to tell the story of these people. It wasn't for the, <coughs> the dead under the bridge. It's, it's a harvest song as well. And just to bring it to back to the seasonal thing, it's, um, it, it's very much a song of a time of year as well. And it l anchors you in. And we actually have quite a few different songs of different times of year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can can we can we end our, our little contribution to one when you're making pilgrimage? I mean, we we define pilgrimage as unbroken journey on foot to wholesome, holy, or special places. The word holy can cause trouble, can ring alarm bells for people who find religion, uh, you know, a toxic idea, and people do. There's an allergy in modern Britain to a lot of the language of Christianity, especially. Um, but a holy place comes from the old English halich which just means whole, holistic, the same root as the word healthy. It, you know, it comes with no religious prescription at all. And pilgrimage, as a word, comes from per agar, through the fields, or, or peregrinus, stranger, strangers through the fields. You don't need any particular religious belief, but obviously you're welcome to put any story or any meaning on top of that. Um, and holy places in Britain, you know, they are natural, they are places of fertility, there are ancient trees, there are river sources, there are hilltops, as well as the stone temples, the places where communities are gathered and done their best to focus their love, hopes, dreams, fears in one place. And what do you do with these churches? I mean, it's a real problem today. People don't know what they're for anymore. That in Britain, what we've gone up to 45% of people over the last four years, from 23% who said we've got no religion. And that's unprecedented. You know, A number of people saying, that's not for me. And yet these temples, exist and they are astonishing places built for song and so song really is we believe one of the best ways to engage with a church and this is music of the spheres the earliest written notated music with words in Britain is from a chap called Saint Godric who was a hermit a contemporary of Beckett and Beckett used to go to him for advice he was uh, he was born a Saxon but he lived in Norman England and he was a strong red-bearded man, merchant, very rich, who became a hermit. And he lived in Finchale. And he channeled these dream songs from the Virgin Mary. And just got to imagine what her voice would have sounded like in a dream. I mean, whatever your belief is. <laughs> the sweetest mother voice you can imagine, I'm sure. And they were written down, three of these songs, by a monk called Reginald. And um, we have a couple of them. And we could just want to give you one of these songs, please, as a sort of, as a, as a blessing on your way. Um, and this is... Uh, in Old English, not Latin, um, and it's to Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas, God is truth, Timbreus fire a shuna hus, at the board, at the bar, Saint Nicholas, bring us well done. Sainte Nicolaes, God is truth, Timbreus fire a shuna hus, At the port, at the bar, Sainte Nicolaes, Bring us well done. Sainte Nicolaes, God is truth, Timbreus fire a shuna hus, at the board, at the bar, Saint Nicholas, bring us wealth. Uh, one thing to say about that, I, I, I had a, a sort of, it's quite a short song. I mean, it's not like, it's not, it's not your usual sort of lots of stanzas and lots of verses. So perhaps. Christianity back then, they were doing mantric singing. I, I, I just feel it's like a mantra. It's very short. It's repetitive. And um, one of the things that's good about repetitive chant, as um, I learned from Jill, who sits there, um, is that um, they're so short and they're so repetitive that you, you s you, you're just going back on yourself. It doesn't go anywhere. The music doesn't... Like Varg Wagner takes three hours to get from the beginning to, to the end, whereas a, a repetitive mantra... <laughs> Whereas, 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 <laughs> uh, whereas, no, no. whereas the mantra goes to circle and it keeps you in the present, you know, um, and, and that's a very important part of 
what that song I think is about. Oh, sorry, one, one last thing, which is pilgrimage as well, because well, you think of pilgrimage as going from here to there, you know, you go from your home to this holy place to get your blessing. But in fact, the holy place is only the halfway point, because really what you're doing is going there to collect the blessing and bring it home, exactly. you know, and that's a full pilgrimage there and back again, as, as Tolkien called it. Before Guy has another word about Wagner. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that um, I think what they do is terrific, and it replicates. It, well, in, it, it, it's it's an example of um, something that uh, I did with the Monteverdi Choir in 2006. We made the um, pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela uh, just with a tuning fork and uh, 20 singers, and we sang in churches on the way um, in France and all through northern Spain till we arrived in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. And uh, we had fantastic reception wherever we went, but not from the clergy. You, you mentioned how th um, these wonderful buildings are, in a sense, empty of purpose today. They've lost their purpose, and music can bring it back. And the extraordinary and distressing thing to me is how often, um, not just the Catholic clergy, but other clergy, um, introduce impediments to that. They don't, want to, they don't want the music. In Spain, in the wonderful cathedrals they have, the area known as the Capella, which is where the, the choirs sang, is off, off bounds, it's off, off limits to choirs today. Uh, and that seems incredibly sad to me. And um, where I work a lot in Leipzig, um, performing in the Thomaskirche where Bach worked, creates opposition from the local clergy in some curious way. It's most bizarre. One of the church festivals which I absolutely adore um, is Rogation Tide, um, which has now almost disappeared uh, from the churches, but it's when the parish priest would beat the bounds of the village uh, with the, the, the school children and sing at strategic points along the boundaries of the and um, the as I remember it happening on our farm when I was very very little and being the littlest I was put up in 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 the white beam tree that uh, on the parish boundary it was really beautiful listen we have to stop but can I just um, end with um, uh, one thing I, I, we've been talking about the power of music and the and and the super well not the superior the elevated state of music to reflect emotion and to to reroute us, but also poetry does it and local poetry does it, and this is a poem that I learnt from our shepherd when I was a little boy. I hope you'll understand it because it's in Dorset. Oh, I be shepherd of the farm, we tinkling bells and sheep dogs bjerk, and with me crook of dirt in my arm, you're I to rove below the lurk. And I'd abide all day among my bleating sheep and picture the fold, and when the evening songs to be come, to see them all append and fold. And I beside a hawthorn tree, to sit upon a sunny down, with shades of summer clouds to flee, we silent flight along the ground. And there among the many cries of sheep and lambs, my dog to pass a sultry hour, we blinking eyes and noses scratched upon the grass. But at my word, hey, 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 he's all awake and up and gone, out round the field like any bird to see what he's sent upon. And I'd go to washing pool, a zousin' overhead in years, a shaggy sheep to clean their wool and make him ready for the shears. And when the shearing time to come, then we to work from darn till dark. Some are shearing of the sheep, and others are making of me me master's mirk. And when the shearing's all are done, then we to eat and drink and sing in master's kitchen, till the ton we merry sounds do shake and ring. Oh, I be shepherd of the farm, we tinkling bells and sheep stonks bjerk, and with me crook a dirt me arm, you're I to rove below the lurk.